Well, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. We're going to uh, begin a presentation, uh, which we call the sermon, and it's going to be a continuation of the last two weeks. Um, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for all the things that you do in our lives and for the Sabbath, for the fellowship that we can have, the truths that you have presented that have worked upon our hearts, and for the work that you've been doing in our lives recently. We know, Lord, that we have faced many trials and difficulties as we have sought your face. And we know, Lord, that these all have a purpose. We just pray that as we study together uh, on this Sabbath, that your Holy Spirit can speak to our hearts and make clear to us these truths. Help myself and Heidi as we share uh, what you are doing in our lives, in our understanding, in our relationship with you. Uh, we pray, Lord, that we can share it clearly and that it can touch others as well. We pray for each person who is studying. We pray for their families, for their needs. We know, Lord, that we can't help each other physically. We're not there with each other, but we can pray for one another and you can send others to help, uh, to encourage, to uplift, and, and to um, relieve us of these trials that we sometimes face. Help us to depend upon you for all things. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, happy Sabbath again. Now, over the last two Sabbaths, I had done uh, some presentations. They were entitled Love. There's Love Part 1. And then last week, I worked on Love Part 2. Now, these were sermons that I had done in the past. And so I was working from these old notes. Now, in the first presentation... The main idea that I was trying to get across is that uh, God is different than we are. That is, he thinks differently. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And we are in the darkness of sin. We're separated from God. And in order to understand uh, God and God's love, God has to reveal this to us. That is, we don't know the solution to our problems. This, this is the gospel, and God reveals the gospel through Christ. So Christ comes to us, light shines in the darkness where we are, and this darkness uh, draws us to God. But we also know men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. So in order to redeem man, God has to do something quite radical. He has to become man. The Son of God, Jesus Christ, is God manifest in the flesh. The same flesh, the same body that you and I have. And he took upon himself our nature in its fallen condition. Not the eighth nature of Adam before Adam fell, but the nature of Adam after 2,000 years. Well, I guess 4,000 years of sin, right? And so that nature is our nature. And then he has a solution to the sin problem, and that solution is different than our solution. And we looked uh, uh, last Sabbath at um, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, as well as uh, James chapter 1, dealing with the law of liberty. And the idea there is that um, without the Spirit of God, the law written and engraven on stones can only condemn us. But with God's spirit, there, there's a veil that can be taken away. And that veil allows us to see God's face so that we can see him, so we can see God with an open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, and are changed into the same image from glory to glory. If we look in the mirror and we only see our own face, uh, we can't. We can't be changed. And that's what the law written and engraven on stones are, is we can look at them and we can see that we're sinners, but it doesn't have any power to transform us. We need the power of the gospel. 
Now, um, my wife Heidi is going to be sharing her testimony uh, of what God has been doing over the last few weeks. And her testimony is tied up in my personal testimony as well. That is, God has been teaching us things about his character. And we know that man is in this darkness regarding the character of God. So we know men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. So how does God reach us? And this is hopefully what we can come to understand as we go through this. Now, I want to just um, read again, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12 to 18. So Paul says, seeing that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. And this is true of many Seventh-day Adventists. Of the reading of the Bible, they have a veil over their face. They cannot clearly see God's character. They act and operate uh, with a misapprehension of who God is. So it's true of Seventh-day Adventists, many of us. Um, that even unto this day, when Moses or the law or the prophets or the New Testament or the spirit of prophecy is read, there's a veil upon their heart. Uh, nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now, the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And we looked at what liberty is. This is a freedom. This is a freedom uh, in Christ. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. So this law, this law of liberty, as James calls it, when we look into it, we are to behold the glory of God. And we are to be changed into the same image from glory to glory, glory representing character. So I'm just going to ask a few questions. Some of them are rhetorical. Um, so the problem, you know, what is the problem Paul pre presents here? What is the problem that he's presenting? Wh where is the problem? What was the problem with the Jews? What does he say? He says their minds are blinded. That is, their minds are blinded because of their sin. Right? Because of their sin, we can't behold the glory of the Lord. They were unwilling to look upon that which could save them. Again, if they had looked, what would have been the result? So if they could have beheld it, if they had looked, uh, the problem was they would die, right? Now, of course, self needs to die, but people don't want to die. Self does not want to yield. It wants to exalt itself. So Paul presents a solution that is to turn to the Lord. And when we turn to the Lord, this veil can be taken away. And when this veil is taken away, what, what are we then able to do according to this passage? When the veil is taken away, what shall, what will we be able to do? Well, then he can see clearly. And we, yeah. So, yeah. So when the veil is taken away, we can with open face behold the glory of the Lord. Right? That, that's what can happen. We can behold, we can have a revelation of Jesus Christ. And the result when we when we behold with uh, the glory of the Lord right as in a class with an open face what happens what's the result according to verse 18 we are going to be changed into the same image 
from glory to glory, right? This is the work. We are in bondage to sin and death. And yet God has a solution on how to deliver us from this bondage, from this slavery. But you can see the problem. We're in the darkness of sin. We have the light of Christ's character. And so even though he presents this here, it's not it's not something that we can simply do without Christ. Now, uh, what what I want to look at, so we're going to have a little bit of a, a discussion, Heidi and I, um, and then I'm going to focus upon this message of, of what this movement is about. So often when we think about this movement, we think that it's about, you know, chronology or the prophecies, the prophetic periods. Uh, but we know that ultimately the center of all of this is the cross, the cross of Christ. All of this points to the work of Christ, of what he done had done while on earth, what he had accomplished, and what he wants to do within our hearts. So it's not it's not just an intellectual message about math and, and chronology. Um, okay, so I'm gonna just get rid of this background here so you can see us, see my wife and I clearly. Okay. So do you want to get on this side? So this is my wife, Heidi. So um, Heidi, you're going to have to share a little bit about what it is that uh, you've gone through. So the first thing, how have you seen God most of your life being raised as a seventh day? Well, unfortunately, um, it's okay. You got this, Heidi. Unfortunately, I grew up thinking that God was a tyrant. And he was, he was out to get me and out to discipline me at every fault that I made. Every stumble that I made, every bad decision I did, and that was enforced in my home, unfortunately. Now, you were able to come to understand the gospel and share it with others. How could you see, uh, share the, share the truth with others, not, but not understand it yourself? I was brought up through how I was treated that the gospel applied to everyone except me. It was something that came naturally to me, I guess, because I learned that God cared about people, but it was always a distant feeling away from God that he didn't really apply to me like he does everyone else. Mm -hmm. So how did this affect um, your relationship to to people, to this message? Uh, how did it affect you? Well, recently, um, I've been having a very hard time, to be honest. And I had to just stop coming to the meetings because I was emotionally and um, spiritually shut down. Just came to a place where I was, I guess you could say, stuck, really. I just came to a spiritual crisis where I couldn't move forward and I couldn't move back. I was stuck. Now, you also have experienced um, a lot of physical pain. Hi, Stephen. Uh, so you've experienced physical pain. Now, how would how would the physical pain that you experienced be related to your view and understanding of God's character? Well, unfortunately, like I said, it wasn't 
and you have the privilege of coming from a very healthy mindset of a home. And a lot of trauma was enforced on me. So naturally, the trauma that was done to me was a reinforcement that God was angry. And somehow I was a horrible sinner. Okay. Now, um, so when we first were married over 10 years ago, you prayed that God would heal you. And God has been healing you through this time. But um, when you look at how God has healed you, what is involved in healing? Why does why did God not just heal you right from the beginning when you first prayed? God's not a magician, first of all. <laughs> and second of all, I'll have to go through different stages, I've learned. But although we'd like to see it our way, naturally. There are certain things and certain mindsets, I guess you could say, that we have to uh, work through, certain lies, certain ideas in our heads. That in order for God to work through us and with us, we have to cooperate with him. It's not something he can do for us. He essentially has to do it with us that makes sense right. so this work of cooperation god could he could just remove all of the problems right physical problems pain and so forth but if he did so he wouldn't really heal what needs to be healed well, it wouldn't benefit us and he knows that yeah. but from our human viewpoint standpoint of course we just want to be free without having to do anything you know like to analyze our thoughts or or any of that you know we just want from a carnal nature we want what we want when we want it how we want it right but that's not how it works yeah many many christians want to have the ex, the spiritual lottery right? oh, yeah. it's yeah. just I know you know everything's going to be great god just gives us all this power and we can just we're that's never going to face any trials but that's not reality it just isn't so now you had some healing recently. That is correct. <laughs> yes. And that's part of why she's giving the testimony. That's why we're But the healing is not just the physical healing. So what had to happen before you were going to be physically healed? Like so many times in my life, I had to go through a major battle, hmm. a major struggle. It wasn't all roses and, you know, path that was pleasant at all. I had to go through some deep searching. Um, we actually had the pastor come because I was spiritually at my wit's end. And for me to share things with Heidi, since we've been married for a long time, I probably sound a little bit like a stuck record. Um, so <clears throat> some of the things that I was sharing she really needed to hear from the pastor from the church because a lot of this trauma uh, happened from her experience as a Seventh-day Adventist. And so uh, the pastor talking to you and basically mm -hmm. apologizing for the way the church treated you, that that did have an effect. Mm -hmm. right. So Because we have a good relationship with the pastor mm -hmm. and because he can, you know, as a man of God, step in and say, okay, we're all sinners, but that's difficult for, you know, I can understand where you would have a struggle based on your experiences with the church. Yeah. So the pastor came one week and talked to us and we explained how you, mm -hmm. how you were feeling and what you were going through. And then he prepared a study. Now, can you share some of the things that you learned from this study that uh, he'd given you? So it's just a really simple question and answer, you know, question, and then an answer from scripture on and and there was some passages that really affected you that helped you. So can you so share some of those? He gave me actually like three pages. Is it two or three? Three pages. Three pages. Three pages of 
identity with God and God's character, which sounds elementary maybe to some, but, um, and then he asked me to pick some that stood out to me and to um, apply them to myself, which initially sounded easy, but um, it wasn't. Um, so the first one was Isaiah 60, 61, verse 7 and 8. And, um, Theodore, do you want to read that for us? Okay, so, well, from the King James, it says, For your shame, you shall have double. And for confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be unto them. Uh, for I, the Lord, love judgment. I hate robbery for burnt offerings. I will direct their work in truth, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Okay, so um, it struck me weird because of the things I have. Mm. Things I have dealt with. Um, such a shame. Such a shame and somewhat of religious abuse, which I hate to say probably affects us all in some way, or at least we might have interpreted it that way. I mean, we live in a sinful world, right? But mine was meant directly as religious abuse. So from that perspective, it meant more to me that God Yeah. now this passage here just to explain a little bit about it so when I had if, if somebody said to you for your shame ye shall have double uh, we may not know what, what's, what the scripture is talking about I didn't um, no, I uh, and for confusion they shall rejoice in their portion therefore in their land they shall possess the double what is the double that's being talked about here. Isn't God saying he's going to give us joy and, and, and the blessings that will more, more than compensate for all our sufferings? Yes. But here the double or the double portion, this is the blessing that was given, um, that was passed on to the firstborn, at least it was supposed to be. It didn't generally happen that way in the line of Christ. But this was the double portion, right? So you have, of course, the kingship, the priesthood, and the double portion. This is the blessing of the firstborn, right? So, and this is talking about the land as well. So that would be the double portion. But here, um, if you want to add how you've come to understand this as applying to you, how would you apply this to you? Well, to me, it means something different, that God has enough ability and willingness to forgive me as a person. Um, somehow, I thought I deserved what happened. And um, he's only happy to his promise, but <laughs> I came to realize that that couldn't be true. If this text was true. And that God, <clears throat> sorry, I'm trying to speak clearly. He does have enough compassion to help me, and he's strong enough and willing to help me. And he is aware of what I've dealt with. You know, because it was. It was a disconnect for me for until recently. Um, and just knowing that God cares and that he's able to help restore me and let me go with pain. Okay. 
Now, we have here a paraphrase of this scripture, and you wrote some of these in your own words um, of how you looked at it. Um, so do you want to read how you paraphrased this um, this verse, these, these verses? Would you? I think I just did that. Actually. Oh, you did that? Oh. Yes, I did. <laughs> okay. Now, um, so another way, in, and we're just going to read another version, the contemporary English version, which helped a bit. It says, they were terribly insulted and horribly mistreated. Now they will be greatly blessed and joyful forever. I, the Lord, love justice, but I hate robbery and injustice. My, my people, I solemnly promise to reward you with an everlasting covenant, an eternal agreement. And so when we think about what, what God's love means to us, it's easy to apply it to others. God loves people, right? We know God is love. But we can see, and if we go to what, you know, Dwight was talking about, how that we can be so cruel to those around us that we can backbite. We can, in the study from last night, picking at flaws rather than seeking to be reconciled to our brethren. These types of things show that we don't know God. He that says he loved God but does not love his brother is a liar, right? So in order to, to understand and experience God's love, um, it's tied with our experience with one another, with the conflicts that we have. With this verse yeah. in the contemporary English version says they were terribly insulted and horribly mistreated now they will be greatly blessed and joyful forever. Yeah. You know, that really struck me because I've always thought, okay, you know, when we get to heaven, we'll have perfect bodies and everything will be fine. And that's just that, right? But I didn't realize that now God wants to give us peace. Mm -hmm. And God can heal us. Prison, peaceful now, mm -hmm. you know. I didn't realize God was... now able to heal i mean i've seen healing things but not this sensitive mm -hmm. to me do you know what i mean like yeah okay so once you came to understand this everything just went smooth right after that right? oh yeah no. <laughs> that's again not reality no it just isn't yeah so <clears throat> so you were experiencing lots of pain physical pain oh terrible pain i was was it two weeks ago? Yeah, and you were highly agitated. Yes, I, I was not having a good weekend. Started mm -hmm. Friday, numbing, burning sensation, um, tingling, and just uh, extreme terrible pain. Yeah, I actually had never seen her in such pain. And also... He had to help me get dressed, get to the bathroom, just everything that was not functionable at all okay at so all. i mean and we also know that i was healed of fibromyalgia so this is not fibromyalgia this is just to clarify this is in my spine my spine and my sacrum but now now it's at it's 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 extreme like i knew satan was so there's a struggle going on hard now um so what happened to that pain that you had all your life to you tell the story. It's funny you should ask. <laughs> so it lasted till 13th. It didn't go away right away. It just didn't. It, in fact, it intensified and it came through waves and it was a horrible weekend. And um, I was even dissociating in pain at one point. Mm -hmm. And uh, 13th came around, that's Monday, and I was still a little sore, but I was able to, you know, get around and do some laundry function because my personality, I just, I can't lay around. It's not something that works for me. And um, so upon reflecting upon these things, the pastor suggested I just focus on a couple a week, this kind of thing. So these were my verses. And, um, you know, we went for walks and trying to exercise and 
follow the eight rules of uh, laws of health and all the rest of it. And uh, came bedtime and I was still not feeling that great. Or we decided to go to bed early that night, 7.30. Yeah. And we were exhausted. I just, I couldn't <laughs> do anymore. And so Theodore, I was commenting that, you know, one day God will heal me and tell me that. But, um, you know, tomorrow's another day, whatever. Got through today, got some things done. But uh, God was telling Theodore to pray over me just before he went to bed. Now, normally, that wouldn't, you know, prayer is important. We've always believed in prayer. I've had healings, like I said, with my fibromyalgia and so on. And I've come a long way. But there was something different about this prayer. Well, I knew. Well, that? I knew God told me to pray over her and that she would be healed. So that's what I did, and we were healed right away. And it left. Yeah. Immediately, it wasn't like it was a delayed response. It was just like it was like this heaviness left the room. And, it was gone. Yeah. and Heidi just needed to have that prayer. It's not like there was something like I'm a divine healer or anything like that. She's it's an just, person like it's just that she needed to have that prayer. She needed that personal touch and prayer to know that God had healed her and that he was going to heal her. And, and so God uses people in this way. Uh, we, don't, it's, we don't believe that we can just make God heal somebody because we prayed. No, so, it has to be God's yeah. will. It has to be God's timing. It has to be God's... Yeah ways right you know that so so you know it to me it was pretty much a miracle that was hard for you to kind of accept that this pain was gone oh yeah i mean (laughs) when i got anointed he had a harder time yeah and he was he was in denial and probably shock and sure this is for real like sure you can touch your toes and jump around and whatever well yeah but for me this time it was I was struggling because I'm going, okay, this just doesn't make sense. Like, is this normal pain? And we've been talking ever since about normal pain versus what I had, right? Um, so that was that was interesting. And then shortly last week, I decided to go to Warburg to share with his family and take a, take a break, different change of scenery, what have you. And uh, so... So then I, you know, I was telling people, and sure enough, people were believing it. I mean, chiropractors can help me, and massage therapists can help me, but we've been doing the massage at home and hydrotherapy. So, you know, we've not only been following the eight laws of health, we've been using natural treatments, using natural treatments and saving money. So, but, but the pain that you had really wasn't natural pain. There no, wasn't actually something no. physically wrong that's that what was the causing this pain. That's what the chiropractor told me. That's what yeah. the massage therapist yeah. told me, and I just finally gave up with that. It was yeah. this was this was point. basically a pain that comes from believing the lie. Yeah. And and it was trauma. Trauma pain. That yeah. you know memories and things like that. Just so, kind of so for that to be removed, you know. Now yeah. it is true though that your uh, whiplash scar disappeared. Yes, I had a whiplash so, scar uh, from two thousand up in my left quadrant of my arm there or the back back and it it used to bother me ever since it was, I mean, a, it was still it's a tight knot it's a tight knot but, but it, that's it's, gone it's my gone. trauma to the, my knee is gone yeah so that's interesting there are some physical you things know, but the most of the pain you were experiencing wasn't really because there was something wrong physically no it was just nobody could find anything it was just no. uh, trauma it, it was memory. literally it was literally like a tight stronghold on my spine, and and I just couldn't release it no matter what I did. No, so there's still a struggle that you're going through as you st- continue to study and to understand God's love. No, right? There always will be in this world. And, and I think all of us have this struggle on some level. Now, for me personally, um, I'd never realized how much... Um, I felt uh, guilt in the sense that, you know, my wife was healed and that it was sort of 
uh, my fault. And that's really hard to explain. It doesn't even make any sense. But, but, um, just that, um, that the healing that happens, uh, with those around us is also part of our own healing. I understand much more clearly why we face the trials that we do. God isn't cruel. He is not punishing us. That he is trying to speak to us. He's trying to teach us what we need in order so that we can be like him in character because we're unlike God. And yet we have to become like him in character. And the trials that we are going to face are going to be much worse than the trials that we are presently experiencing. And so God is preparing us for that. And it's in his mercy and love that he does this. He can't really save humanity without the cross, not just the cross of Christ, but also our personal cross. We have to yoke up with Christ. And without this experience, he couldn't just place us in heaven. Right? There's, I mean, there's the whole issue of the great controversy involved here as well. But I realized, too, that what was really trapping me was not actually my pain inwardly. I mean, my physical pain. It was more the lies that had me trapped. The strongholds. Literally, it had my body trapped. Yeah, so Satan had these strongholds because of the lies. This basic And instead of thinking program. that God had shut me down, I, in a sense had learned how to shut God down. Mm -hmm. I, in a sense, had learned how to keep God at bay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. All right. Okay. So go back here. So I hope that was a blessing to people to hear Heidi's testimony, um, what she has been through, because all of us have experienced this to some degree. We, we, all, experience trials. we all experience trials. And, um, uh, and sometimes we wonder about these trials. Why am I going through this experience? Why couldn't God just remove the trial? Why can't God just remove the mountain? Why do we have to climb it? Um, and we understand this to some degree intellectually. All of us understand the importance of trials, that these uh, these troubles that we face are, are developing in us a Christ-like character, and that the sufferings of this present world are not to be compared with the eternal weight of glory you know, of what God has planned. But God has that plan for us now. One of the things that, that Heidi has come to understand is, but this suffering that we experience, um, we can have peace now. We can have joy now. We can have healing now. Um, and we need to have that in order to minister to those around us. And now I can help people like my sister-in-law who tweaked her knee. I help yeah. her. Just... Yeah. So it's, it's kind of amazing because Heidi's always been a hard worker and, uh, but working through pain is pretty difficult. Anybody who's had, uh, you know, uh, pain um, and trying to work. Um, so the one job that she does that normally took three hours, she did in two hours, mm -hmm. which is pretty amazing. She And she didn't feel like she was working harder, um, but also been able to take on more jobs uh, that God has provided right after she was healed. He provided her uh, more work. One is helping uh, my sister who does cleaning and has uh, can't work now because of her knee. And then also another um, job that uh, six hours a week. So uh, she wouldn't have been able to do that uh, previously. So, so we thank God for what he's done and we pray for, for every one of you uh, that is facing trials. And we know that, that Christ understands, but it's, it's difficult. We're in the midst of that trial. Now, um, I didn't expect to take so long for the personal testimony, uh, but I want to go back to um, my notes here. So I'm going to go back here. Um, 
And I want to address what I'm not going to be presenting next Sabbath. So we haven't really decided. Uh, I was thinking of asking Stephen if he wants to do the sermon next Sabbath, but I don't, he's, he's here, but I don't know um, whether he's going to be willing to or not. Um, because Dwight's doing the Sabbath school. It wouldn't be fair to have Dwight do the Sabbath school and the sermon, but he might have to if uh, Stephen doesn't take it. It's also possible we could have someone else uh, do the sermon. But uh, anyway, I'm not going to be able to complete this sermon this week, and I, and I won't be here next week. So it would be completed uh, the following Sabbath, so on December 9th. So when we deal with this uh, beholding, uh, with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord. This is Christ's character. Right? We need to know of God's character. But it's not a simple thing. We have trials that we have to face. And we know that the everlasting gospel is a three-step testing prophetic message that develops and demonstrates two classes of worshipers. Uh, this is something that this movement has understood uh, for a long time. So we know as Seventh-day Adventists, this is the three angels' messages. And when we look at the three angels' messages, uh, what do we generally think of, of these messages? What are they? I know that's a really broad question. So what are these Three angels' messages. So the everlasting gospel, right? I saw another angel fly in the midst of having, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. Now, one of the things interesting when we look at this verse is this everlasting gospel. Which one actually says that it's the everlasting gospel? Does it say that with the second? Does it say that with the third? It just says it with the first, right? Now, it doesn't mean that the second and the third aren't also the everlasting gospel. But we know that some people place just the third angel's message as the message of the gospel. But all three messages are the gospel, the everlasting gospel. Right. And this is the gospel that has to be preached to every nation, kindred, tongue and people. Now, in uh, verse 7, we know, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. So it actually has a reference back to creation and to the fourth commandment, to the Sabbath. And within this uh, message, we have all three messages, fear God, give glory to him, and for the and the hour of judgment has come, right? So we know that in that first message is contained all three messages. <clears throat> now, we also know that we have Revelation 18. So this ties in a little bit with the studies that we did last night. Uh, the mighty angel of Revelation 18 is going to come down and lighten the earth with his glory. Right, so we can we can see how this is tied to what Paul is writing in Second Corinthians chapter three, that we behold in a glass the glory of the Lord. Now, when we think about a glass, what is a glass? Yeah, in the King James it says a glass, but what is it? A mirror. It's a mirror. And we know that we talk about a prophetic mirror or a chiasm. Now how can that reveal the glory of God? Because if we talk about looking in a mirror, how do you look in a mirror, a, a spiritual mirror? Because we could say, well, you know, you look into this mirror. Well, how do you do that? Obviously, we can't go and find this mirror somewhere and, and look at our face. So we know it's a figure. It's a symbol. But how practically does God present this mirror to us, this glory to us? Where is it found? It's, Can we it's sit in, in his word. What's that, Angela? 
it's it's in his word. The more we read his word, the more we, we become close to Christ, the more Christ reveals himself to us, the more we see ourselves as we really are and we repent. Because when we talk about man's mm-hmm. solution to the sin problem. When Moses, when Moses asked God to show him his when Moses asked God to show him his glory, he passed before him and declared his character. Right, his character. So we need to know the character of God. And so it's described as looking into a mirror, into a glass, which we know if if we understand the scriptures the way that we have come to understand the scriptures, that this mirror is represented in the prophecies of scripture. Ellen White says that we need to present to the people uh, Christ as represented in uh, types and and symbols. I don't know if that's the exact word she uses. But the idea is that if we are going to present Christ to people, it can't be the Christ of the imagination. Theodore. Yeah. Brother Theodore, can I read a verse? Um... Yeah, you can read something. What are you going to read? Second Peter, I think it's meant. Okay. Second Peter. Second Peter. Uh, let's see. Is it Second Peter or is it First Peter? No, it's Second Peter. In what verse or chapter? It's uh, chapter one, I think. And it okay. says in verse nineteen, "This is this is to me is what Christ is about." Mm-hmm. And I and I read these all the time to people. It says, "We have a sure, also sh- also a more sure word of prophecy, unto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in the, a dark place, until the day dawneth and the day star rises in your heart, knowing this first that no prophecy of the scripture." is of any private interpretation for the prophecies came not in old times by the will of God, but holy men of God <clears throat> spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Okay, to me, that's Jesus yeah. Christ. Yeah, so, so and, and the reason he brings this here, he's talking about the Mount of Transfiguration. So Peter was there with uh, uh, James and John on the Mount of Transfiguration. They saw Moses and Elijah talking to Christ, right? And that's when it says, for he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the Holy Mount. Right. So he says we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We're not following cunningly, cunningly devised fables uh, when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we're eyewitnesses of it. They beheld, in a sense, the second coming representative represented by Elijah, who represents those that are going to be translated without seeing death, death. And Moses, who will be resurrected from the dead. So they understood this figure that they were seeing. But he says, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. So that means prophecy is more sure than actually if we were eyewitnesses of something. Correct? Uh Right? So, So we have this more sure word of prophecy. And um, so when we look at this prophecy, this prophecy is the mirror that we look into. That is, if we want to see Christ, we don't sit and meditate in some field and, and, you know, do some kind of mantra and get into a trance and then have some vision of some being coming to us. We know that the Holy Spirit has to bring to our understanding what's written in the prophecies, in God's word. Because we can't even understand the prophecies of scripture. They're not of any private interpretation because we need the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that inspired uh, the holy men of God when they were moved by the Holy Ghost. 
right? So when in the first presentation, when I talk about God's plan, that man is so different from God, that God is love and man is not, right? That God um, has a way of operating that is completely different to how we operate. But he, because we are in sin, he has to reach us with this gospel. And so he has used the prophecies of scripture uh, to reveal to us his plan for us. So if we look at the Bible just merely as a devotional book, some good advice that we can have on how to uh, live a happy life here on earth, then we don't understand uh, the gospel. Um, and it's it's interesting if you take this verse, so Iran has pointed out, you can see there in the chat, um, it's the reverse sum has all the numbers of July 18, 2020, right? So 2187. Now we know, of course, that these symbols that God has given us, these prophetic symbols, the way marks, this line upon line to illustrate the gospel is not the illustration of the gospel is not the gospel itself, right? Just like the law written in graven and stones is not the law itself. It has to be written upon the heart. And, and what we're going to look at in uh, two weeks time when I go through this is I'm going to go through um, how the everlasting gospel, how Christ is revealed in these messages, what we call the three angels messages. And that they represent an experience uh, of the individual, not just the experience of God's people. So this is something that we understand. So we've understood this in this movement, that the three-step testing prophetic message, the three angels' messages, have to be applied not just historically in Millerite history, but also that this movement is going through the experience of those messages but also us as individuals are experiencing this message. And that if we fail to understand this experience, then we are no different than the Jews. If in presenting the truth to others, what we call the truth, we are critical, we are condemnatory, that we shun, that we tear down, that we destroy, that we are accusers of the brethren, it shows that that message has no effect upon us. And often what we do when we, we run into these conflicts is we can get caught up in the conflict ourselves. We can take up our sword and cut off the high priest here. or not the high priest servants here, whatever. It's not the high priest, but the servant of the high priest. His ear, right? But he that takes up the sword, that sword, shall perish by the sword. We have a better sword, the word of God. So, so I want people to think about these things. I'm, I know I'm not doing the best job I could possibly do in presenting these messages about God's love. Um, because it's something that's really beyond us. But I do want us to think about these things. Because if this movement is going to accomplish the task that God has given us, each one of us individually has to be transformed. And when we look at uh, what God wants to accomplish, we can all agree it's much more than any of us could accomplish on our own, right? There's not one of us who says, I have all these skills to give this gospel to the world. I have very little skills to do that. I might be able to influence those around me. But for this work to be accomplished, it's going to require the cooperation of every person in this movement with Christ so that we can work together in a united fashion. But that's going to be later on that we're going to get into that more. So for now, um, I thank everyone for coming, but let's close in prayer. <clears throat> Dear gracious Heavenly Father, 
We are thankful for the work that you do in our lives, for the testimony of Heidi, of what you're doing in her life. We pray that it can be an encouragement uh, to everyone who is struggling um, with guilt and shame, even those that are ministering to others who don't really consider that uh, the gospel is for them. We know, Lord, that um, you deeply love us and care for each of us individually, that you came and died for each one of us. And so we just ask that this Sabbath and uh, this week ahead will be a blessing uh, to us in our relationship with you. We pray for one another. We lift up each other in prayer. Help us to constantly keep in mind this work and your church and the people that are seeking for truth. Be with us through the rest of this day. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.